My talk is about the challenges of feeding Europe and the world in 2050. By that time, the world population would have, will have increased by two to three billion inhabitants of, before just stabilizing at that level. This additional people to feed is not, in fact, the main challenge uh, for feeding the world. The main challenge is related to the effect modern agriculture already today has on the environment. You probably already heard about the planetary limits. These are threshold value of some indicators of human activity beyond which the habitability of the Earth is compromised. And six over nine of these planetary limits, as defined by Rockström, are already crossed. And modern agriculture has a big part in this crossing. Agriculture is producing one third about of the greenhouse gases, so it's a big responsible of uh, climate change. Agriculture is responsible for most of the loss of biodiversity. And agriculture also is responsible for a complete overhaul of some nutrient cycling, mainly the nitrogen cycling. And I just want to insist a little bit on this aspect. Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Docs. Today's guest is Gilles Belin. Some of his recent comments of relevance to today's conversation were featured in that opening clip. Gilles Belin will be talking about a biogeochemical view of the historical trajectory of regional and global agri-food systems, and from there, an alternative at the global scale and the European scale. The European regional example being a case in point of how regional agri-food systems have become tightly integrated into international food and feed trade networks, a system in which world trade of agricultural commodities seen from a biogeochemical perspective is net exchanges of protein among 12 interconnected regional agri-food systems that taken together make up the global agri-food system. Here to explain what all that means and what it has to do with feeding a growing world population without exceeding safe earth boundaries is Gilles Belin. He joins us from Paris, where he's Emeritus Research Director at the National Center for Scientific Research and Senior Researcher in Biogeochemistry at Sorbonne University. Welcome, Gilles. Thank you. As a unifying metrics, you put uh, nitrogen uh, at the core of your analysis of agri-food systems. And as put in your recent report, Beyond the Farm to Fork Strategy, to quote, nitrogen is at the heart of the debates on the socio-ecological transition of agri-food systems for several reasons, relating to human nutrition, agricultural productivity, ecosystems functioning, and planetary boundaries. So start there, explain that, why nitrogen? Why not nitrogen? Uh, usually, uh, most people are taking are taking the subject in terms of uh, one one other metric, which is calories. Calories is indeed uh, the the metric that is used by dietetician to calculate the, uh, the diet of people. Uh, but in fact. Nitrogen is as important in, as calories. Nitrogen is uh, the, the main uh, component of proteins. And proteins are really what we need for building up our tissues. Calories is a source of energy just to uh, compensate for the exercise a person is experiencing. But really, proteins are needed at a rather constant amount per day for any individuals independently on the exercise he, he is uh, producing in his everyday life. So this amount of about 10 grams of protein per day, per, per capita per day, is the required uh, amount 
for everybody. And on this basis, you can calculate the amount of nitrogen in proteins required per uh, annually for a given population. And this is 4 kg uh, nitrogen per capita per year. And this is a, a very important figure because it gives you the, uh, the objective of agricultural production. You need to produce uh, 4 kg per capita per year of food for feeding the world. And that's all. Uh, and it is convenient also to, to calculate this diet in terms of nitrogen because you can compare it directly with the fertilizers, generally speaking, needed to produce agricultural goods. And nitrogen is among the different fertilizers used in agriculture. Nitrogen is also the one which is the most limiting, generally. Uh, nitrogen is uh, paradoxically a very rare element uh, in the in the soil, although there are plenty of denitrogen, gaseous nitrogen in the atmosphere, but this form of, the, of gaseous nat uh, nitrogen is not available for, for uh, plants, for most plants, so that in fact nitrogen is limiting for the growth of plants and fertilization is mainly uh, a way to add, to bring nitrogen to the soil in order to uh, maintain the fertility, to maintain the possibility of plants to export nitrogen uh, with the harvest. And so nitrogen is really the most convenient metric to calculate uh, what the world has to produce from its agriculture to feed the world. That's the reason why we are interested in nitrogen. Besides that, the nitrogen is also uh, one of the elements for which the natural cycle has been perturbed, uh, disturbed the most by anthropogenic activity. So there are planetary boundaries linked to the cycle of nitrogen and, and we, we should uh, stay behind these planetary limits in terms of nitrogen. So these are the different re reasons for which nitrogen is probably the best metrics for discussing all that. So in your comments, you touched on the paradox of nitrogen. What do you mean by that? Oh, yes. Well, as I said, nitrogen is a, a very essential component of living organisms. So it is, con it is contained in proteins also in nuclear acids and things like that. So it is essential to life. The organic forms of nitrogen are linked to the very structure of living organisms. Besides, there are inorganic forms of nitrogen, such as nitrate, ammonia, uh, nitrite also. Okay, mo most of the inorganic nitrogen on the Earth is as nitrate. But this is nothing compared to the amount of nitrogen, which is the main component of the atmosphere. Everybody knows that the atmosphere contains nearly 80% of the gaseous nitrogen N2, which is a very inert gas. Uh, beside that, there, there is 20% oxygen. In, in fact, we are, we are swimming in a, in, an, in a notion of nitrogen, but other, under a form that cannot be used to make up our uh, tissues. Uh, animals eat proteins from the plants they are eating. Uh, we are eating also proteins from, from our uh, vegetal or animal food. But the primary production of organic matter is based on the uptake of inorganic nitrogen forms, nitrate or ammonia, by plants. Plants generally can only use either nitrate or ammonia. And these, these chemical forms of nitrogen are in very small amounts in the soil. So that each year after the harvest of a field has been uh, taken off from the field, the soil must be replenished with new nitrogen in order to make the further uh, growth of plants possible. Recycling of nitrogen is therefore of 
primary importance for uh, ensuring the fertility of soils. And uh, okay, this can be by recycling, indeed, and or excrements or urine or or uh, feces are and those of animals are full of nitrogen, which has to be to be uh, brought back to the soil in order to uh, guarantee the fertility of it for for the next years. However, the, these inorganic forms of nitrogen, particularly nitrate and ammonia, are very mobile. Ammonia is very mobile because it is a gaseous form which can escape to the atmosphere. Nitrate is very mobile because it is very soluble and any rain draining through the soil profile takes off a, a large amount of nitrate if some is re remain there after, after the, the growth of plants. So these losses or the lack of recycling of nitrogen has been to be compensated by new imports of nitrogen. In natural systems, these new inputs of nitrogen is done through a very exceptional process, which is symbiotic fixation by legumes plant. Legumes like clover, alfalfa, or uh, lucerne, or beans, lentils, all these plants, which are called the legumes, have the capacity, owing to symbiotic association with a special group of bacteria, to transform this N2 molecule, the gaseous nitrogen of the atmosphere, into reactive forms, into proteins, in fact, into reactive forms of nitrogen. And only this group of plants is able to do that. So that, in fact, in natural systems, these losses, these unavoidable losses of nitrogen, due to leaching, due to volatilization, have to be compensated by the activity of this group of plants. And that's okay. For In a forest, you have some, some amount of nitrogen coming back to the atmosphere or, or leach to the aquifers, but this is compensated with a difficulty by the few legumes occurring in the uh, community of plants in a natural ecosystem. This can also be the case in agricultural systems. Uh, <coughs> in traditional agriculture, there is always a, um, an association of plants uh, with one year cultivation of clover, for instance, uh, to feed animals, and then cereals, and then uh, another plant. And this rotation of plants ensure that there is enough nitrogen taken from the atmosphere by legume to ensure that with an efficient recycling of manure and even human excreta, the fertility can be maintained. Once you have very specialized agriculture, like monoculture of cereal, for instance, you have no way to get this new nitrogen necessary to to the fertilization, and you, and you have losses that you cannot compensate. And that's why, in fact, this kind of, ag of very specialized agriculture is only possible owing to industrial fertilizer. Industrial fertilizer came in, uh, in use only from one century ago, in fact. Two German chemists, Fritz Haber and uh, Bosch, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, 1909, he discovered a way to fix atmospheric nitrogen into reactive nitrogen, into ammonia and nitric acid. Their purpose were to, to make explosives. At that time, that was a problem, uh, finding enough nitrate to make uh, explosives. And this was close before the, the First World War. Uh, this process requires lots of energy from coal at that time, now from uh, um, either petroleum or uh, natural gas. But this process of fixation of atmospheric nitrogen into reactive nitrogen allowed to make chemical industrial fertilizers, which are used in place of legumes or in place of a correct recycling of manure or human excreta. And so, uh, modern agriculture is 
largely dependent on these uh, synthetic chemical fertilizers, which has disturbed the nitrogen cycle. Imagine that today more than half the amount of nitrogen put into the biospheric cycle is from industrial activity. So, in, in fact, a human has doubled the amount of nitrogen introduced in the biogeochemical nitrogen cycle. And that's a major perturbation, which allowed uh, an explosion of the, lo the environmental losses of nitrogen to the atmosphere, to the hydrosphere. Massive contamination of uh, groundwater, massive contamination of uh, uh, the atmosphere, uh, and so on. So this is a major disturbance due to this fantastic uh, recourse of uh, industrial fertilizer, which allowed to get rid of this obligation that traditional agriculture had in the past to alternate uh, legumes and cereals and, and ensure that legumes brings back the nitrogen required for uh, ensuring the fertilization of soils. So the use of industrial fertilizer produced under the Harbor Bosch process made it possible for modern agriculture to put an unlimited supply of reactive nitrogen into the soil. So modern agriculture became highly specialized. And with this, as you say, modern agriculture is dependent on industrial fertilizers, which has disturbed the nitrogen cycle. Give us more context on this issue with the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is not abundant in soils. Plants use lots of it to grow, just to make uh, its tissues. Uh, after one harvest, the soil is depleted from this element nitrogen. So in order to make a new harvest possible the year after, new nitrogen has to be brought uh, onto the soil. And this is fertilization, in fact. Fertilization can be, uh, can be just the recycling of the excrement of uh, those animals of, or human having eaten the, the harvest, and that's closed the cycle, except that there, there are some losses in between, uh, or it can be brought by new nitrogen. This new nitrogen, well, uh, it, it's not just recycling, it, it, sh it has to come from elsewhere. Uh, this elsewhere is usually the atmosphere. Pla some plants can bring uh, new nitrogen from the atmosphere by the natural process of symbiotic fixation. Legumes do that perfectly and did that for uh, millenaries on the earth. Uh, industry can do that also, and that's the chemical fertilizer. Some, some opening of the, of the nitrogen cycle always exists at different degree. It always exists because of this mobility of nitrogen. Some environmental losses of nitrogen always happens. But the opening can be just organized because recycling is no more necessary. And so specialization of agriculture into only cereals, for instance, this kind of system, very specialized system, is a complete opening of the system. And so synthetic fertilizer have to be uh, used as the only way of fertilization. So under this specialization of uh, modern agriculture, synthetic or industrial fertilizer has to be used as the only way of fertilization because processes of recycling and symbiotic fixation by legumes uh, done in association with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil, as you explained, have been eliminated. So let's get back to the point you make that since the use of industrial uh, fertilizers, there's been an explosion of environmental losses of nitrogen. Talk about those losses. Well, it, insofar as uh, synthetic fertilizer are now 
representing about half the total amount of fertilizing inputs to the soil. They have increased tremendously the losses, the environmental losses of nitrogen. And these losses are just not uh, losses. In fact, they are causing trouble. They are causing trouble to the hydrosphere. When you have nitrate draining to groundwater, the usual reservoir for drinking water, the possibility of using this water for drinking water completely lost. So uh, th this is one problem. Another problem is that this nitrate-rich water flowing from groundwater to rivers and then to the sea are, in a way, enriching the sea. In, in uh, coastal waters, in coastal marine waters, nitrate is also a limiting nutrient for algae. And uh, algae are growing uh, much more when rivers rich in nitrate are coming in those uh, coastal zones, causing a process of, of algal uh, proliferation, which in itself can be a problem. Uh, uh, in, in France, uh, we have uh, this problem of uh, green algae uh, 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 accumulating on the beaches, but there are many other problems uh, in the, uh, on the coast of the North Sea, some uh, uh, Algae are producing mucus and makes foam. Other algae are producing toxins. Also, sometimes this uh, enormous algal biomass is coming down to the deep zones of the, of the seas and decomposing there, for forming anoxic area, which are called the dead zones. Uh, all these processes, which are grouped under the, the term of coastal eutrophication, uh, are destroying, in fact, uh, the, the capacity of coastal zone to produce fish. Uh, so, so there is a big eutrophication problem linked to this massive use of um, chemical fertilizers. In the atmosphere, we can also speak of the atmosphere, uh, that's a little more complex. Ammonia, which is escaping to the atmosphere, may, may react with another pollutant which is not from agricultural origin, nitric oxide in fact, produced by electric centrals or combustion motors, automobile motors. And this urban pollution meeting the rural or agricultural pollution of, uh, of, uh, ammo by ammonia form together ammonium nitrate, very small particles. And these particles are responsible for a big part of uh, air pollution. So air pollution is a consequence, partly at least, from agriculture, from industrial agriculture. And another very important thing is that also part of these uh, atmospheric losses of nitrogen are under the form of N2O, nitrous oxide, which is the second important greenhouse gas after CO2, after uh, carbon dioxide. And so uh, these environmental losses of nitrogen also increase the warming effect, uh, the greenhouse gas effect, in fact. Uh, and for agriculture, N2O is one of the major uh, greenhouse gas uh, produced. So, okay, and that's again a consequence of the use of industrial uh, fertilizers. So just to be clear, the environmental nitrogen loss you've been talking about refers to the amount of nitrogen that instead of being taken up by plants and converted into food is being lost to the environment. And what your research shows is that more than half the input of synthetic chemical fertilizer is lost to the environment. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, because of this very uh, bad efficiency of recycling, caused not only by the use of, of uh, chemical fertilizers by seed, but by the structural opening of the cycle that the, this use make possible. In a recent article published at The Conversation, you explain agricultural nitrogen surplus is the excess of nitrogen put into the soil in relation to the quantity actually taken out of the soil through harvesting. And this excess uh, 
as you've been explaining, can turn into runoff and drain into the Earth's water systems. It can turn into gas and enter the Earth's atmosphere. And what's called nitrogen waste is the nitrogen surplus not utilized by crops. As context to all this, I want to go back to a point you made at the open, that planetary boundaries are linked to the nitrogen cycle. And to briefly cite your article, quote, that's why the team working under Rockstrom evaluated the agricultural nitrogen surplus when defining the planetary boundaries beyond which conditions for human life on Earth would no longer be guaranteed. The upper limit of this surplus, which is determined to protect water and air locally, varies greatly between world regions, but on a global scale, it's estimated to be 60 million tons of nitrogen per year, in contrast to today's nitrogen surplus of around 130 million tons of nitrogen per year. This huge gap between the threshold not to be overstepped and the actual level reached today justifies the goal that the European Commission and the United Nations Biodiversity Conference recently set itself to have nitrogen waste by 2030. Yet, it's not by simply adjusting practices that nitrogen waste from agriculture will be halved so that planetary boundaries are respected. Industrial producers of fertilizers promote the progress offered by precision agriculture, nitrification inhibitors applied to soil, varietal improvement of crops, and so forth. These new methods that promise progress might open up new lucrative markets for the agriculture supplies industry, but everything else points to them bringing only a negligible drop in nitrogen waste. Indeed, the most effective way to boost efficiency and reduce loss is to scale down agricultural production itself. Can you explain what structural changes you have in mind in making the comment that modern agriculture's bad efficiency of recycling is caused not only by the use of chemical fertilizers, but by the structural opening of the cycle that this use makes possible. And also the comment that it's not simply by adjusting practices that nitrogen waste from agriculture will be halved. Okay, there, there, there are two aspects of this structural change. The first one, we, we already spoke of it, uh, is specialization. What is striking is that when, when you look at the, the structure of our agriculture at the regional uh, scale, everywhere in, in Europe, particularly in France, but everywhere in fact, you have regions specialized into intensive cereal cropping without any animals. And so that, that's a very linear cycle where you put fertilizers, and you, you harvest cereals, and that's all. In other regions, you have all the animals uh, grouped. And in this region, uh, the agricultural production in, is not enough to feed the, these animals, which are very concentrated. So you have to, to import feed for these animals. And they are producing manure, which cannot be used for, for recycling, for, for, for fertilizing uh, the, the, the field because because they are producing too much and so they are they are leached and they, okay and so, so this structural specialization into either livestock farming or uh, crop farming is the cause of enormous l environmental losses of nitrogen that's one aspect the second aspect is that we increased tremendously the intensity of agriculture. Agriculture is producing per hectare, per hectare cropland, much more than it did uh, before. Uh, you may say, okay, but that's because uh, the human population has increased tremendously too. We, and, and we have to continue this movement because uh, the human population will reach uh, 10, 10 billion inhabitants uh, by, by 2050. 
Uh, and so you can say there is no alternative about, uh, compared to, to this increase in productivity. But in fact, when you are looking to the fate of the crop production uh, nowadays, it is for more than 70% just to feed animals. We are producing cereals and other feedstuff not to feed humans, but to feed the animals that humans will eat. And that, that's uh, what has increased the most is the production of crop for feeding animals, which are converting this production into meat and milk, but uh, with a very bad uh, conversion efficiency, because uh, okay, the, the, the efficiency of conversion of vegetal proteins into animal proteins is at most 30%, and that's in the, the most intensive uh, livestock systems. Uh, most of the time it is much less. And, and wh why uh, is that? Wh why do we feed so much animals? It, is that because, in, at least in, the, in, in most occidental countries, the share of animal food has increased tremendously. In the United States, in Europe, about 70% of the proteins taken up by humans are of animal origins, while it was about 30% in the 1960s. So, in less than one century, we, we increased by a factor of two, the share of animals in our food. And that comes, uh, is accompanied by, by uh, well, by a, a need for feed production, including cereals, huh? uh, that, that, is res that is the most important factor of increase of agricultural production. It is not to feed people, that agricultural production has increased so much, it is mostly to feed more animals. <laughs> and, and, okay, and that, that's not needed at all. Uh, it, it is even bad for, for health. There are may, many health problems linked to this increase of animal food in our diet. I am not at all uh, saying that we should be vegetarian. Uh, animals has, are a very good way to convert some proteins which, under, which exist under forms that are not edible by, by human to convert this kind of, of proteins into edible proteins like milk and meat. But once you, f you are feeding animals with proteins under forms that are directly edible by humans, you are wasting uh, completely uh, a resource. Give us more context on how, in the post-World War II era, local and regional agri-food systems throughout the world lost regional self-sufficiency and so autonomy, and through a process of globalization and regional specialization, became integrated into international food and feed trade networks. And Europe, as you say, is an example of this. So tell us something about your analysis of the European agri-food system, and from there, the alternative you explore in your agroecological scenario at the European scale and global scale, respectively. Historically, <clears throat> the, the beginning of the, this process of modernization of agriculture at, at European scale was well to, to get Europe uh, self-sufficient in in food production, and so there, there there was good reason to to try to to get to self-sufficiency. But uh, this process of modernization went hand in hand with an opening. Huh? Uh, the, the purpose of uh, the agricultural policy was really to make Europe an exporting country, much beyond reaching self-sufficiency. Okay, and from that time on, uh, the, the pursuit of an objective of 
exportation by increasing productivity, by specializing uh, agriculture, uh, and, and by, uh, yes, by, by also using more and more chemical uh, fertilizer, uh, became, became the, the first objective. Suddenly, we realized that we are importing uh, enormous amounts of uh, synthetic fertilizer from, from outside Europe, in fact, uh, just because uh, fertilizer are containing so much energy that only countries with large r reserves of uh, fossil energy are producing them and exporting them. Uh, Russia, uh, Algeria, and, and the countries of East, uh, of uh, Middle East, and so on. So, in fact, uh, Europe is extremely depending on uh, external inputs of fertilizer. So, okay, could Europe make without fertilizer? Could the world make without Haber Bosch fertilizer. You know probably our world in data, that's a, a website produced by the Oxford University. And they have visuals about Haber Bosch fertilizers showing how much people in the world are depending on Haber Bosch fertilizer just for, for their food production. Uh, what the, the visuals show is that half the population of the world nowadays depends on Haber Bosch fertilizer for, for its food production. And that's a matter of fact. But uh, what they conclude in the, the site is that uh, Haber Bosch, the invention of the Haber Bosch process, uh, save half the humanity that five billion people would have died without uh, this invention, which is absolutely not true, of course. Uh, if this process didn't have been uh, invented, well, the agronomy would have developed a better way of using uh, of using legume, better way of reconnecting uh, livestock and, and crop farming, and we, we could have also uh, make the life of uh, 10 billion inhabitants, or at least 8 billion inhabitants in the world possible. That's just a way of, uh, of other structural uh, way of organizing our uh, agricultural production. And so w what we explored in our scenario, both at the European scale and at the world scale, is how uh, ca can this be possible? Ca can we indeed feed 10 billion inhabitants of the planet in 2050 without any recourse to synthetic fertilizer? And okay, by, by operating three levers, we showed that it should be possible. First level, first lever is uh, okay. Generalizing this crop rotation, this traditional crop rotation, in fact, where uh, legume alternates with cereals to to make new inputs of nitrogen possible. Second lever, reconnecting livestock and crop farming in order to better close the nitrogen cycle at the regional uh, scale. And the last lever is the one of the diet, uh, reducing uh, by at least a factor of two the share of uh, animal proteins in the human diet. And with this three lever, we show that it is perfectly possible to imagine a future for agriculture, both at European scale, where we did it at very small scale, and at the world scale, where we did it just for 12 regions in the world, we show that it should be possible. The, the field of possibility, the range of possibility, exists that uh, we feed all people in the planet without any of this fertilizer. Okay, that, that, and the, the demonstration, I think, is rather convincing. So what you show with your agroecological scenario is that it's possible to meet the challenge of feeding all people in the world and have nitrogen waste and greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 2050. 
exactly because by uh, well all all these lever i thought about reduce the environmental losses of nitrogen it reduced them from structural reason in fact it reduced them because symbiotic fixation it is a much more efficient process than application of chemical fertilizer because reconnecting livestock and crop and, and, and uh, crop farming also reduce the losses because uh, the recycling is much better organized and uh, reducing the amount of animal proteins in the diet also cause uh, doesn't require as much intensive crop production that, than today and also <coughs> by reducing the intensity of agriculture you automatically reduce the, the losses of nitrogen intensification of the production is the main cause of uh, surplus uh, in the soil nitrogen surplus which is the cause of uh, leaching and, uh, and environmental losses so by uh, reducing the intensity of agriculture you automatically reduce the environmental losses that's why uh, you res you might respect the planetary limits which are about uh, losses in commenting on rising environmental losses of nitrogen and rising international trade in agricultural commodities, you present a visual of the trajectory of the world agri-food system from 1961 to 2009 to 2050. And again, using nitrogen as a unifying metric and expressed in millions of tons per year, in this visual, Agricultural nitrogen loss to the environment is represented on the vertical axis, and trade to the international trade of agricultural commodities on the horizontal axis. From 1961 to 2009 being the actual recorded past trajectory of the world agri-food system, and from 2009 to 2015 being a projection for the future uh, trajectory uh, of the world agri-food system under a business-as-usual scenario to 2050. And what the visual shows is that under a business-as-usual, so mainstream scenario, the past trajectory of rising environmental losses from 1961 to 2009 continues to 2050. So, in short, what this shows is that in the absence of significant change in the structure and operating logic of modern agriculture, so business as usual, a past trajectory of rising environmental losses continues unabated. I'm going to put up another visual in which you compare the business as usual scenario, which in this visual is called the conventional agriculture or 2050 global orchestration scenario, to that of the agroecological scenario called the 2050 equitable diet. The agroecological scenario shows it is possible to reverse course from the past trajectory of rising environmental nitrogen loss recorded from 1961 to 2009. This scenario shows environmental nitrogen loss and large disparities in regional diets um, can both be dramatically reduced by 2050. And in contrast, under the business as usual scenario, both environmental nitrogen losses and large regional disparities in diet continue on a rising trajectory to 2050. In this visual, you call the agroecological scenario the just diet scenario. Uh, why is that? We, we call that the, the just diet or the equitable diet uh, because it's a diet that can indeed be shared with all the inhabitants of the planet. In most scenarios run by economists, you, you still have lots of uh, inequalities in the diet between the different parts of the world uh, because they they consider that there is a, a constant and unavoidable link between the richness between the, uh, the the monetary richness of a country and uh, the diet of this country the, indeed this relationship is apparent when you look at the statistics uh, the most the, the more you you the PIB is high, the more you eat meat and milk. But is that really 
uh, a law of nature? I don't think so. It's just it's not just a question of uh, availability. It's also a, a, a question of health. And uh, eating less meat is certainly less meat and less milk. Huh? But it, it's not a punishment. I mean, <laughs> it's also the 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 way to to maybe to have a to to avoid uh, coronary diseases and uh, lots of other diseases. So, well, it can be a, a, a choice. A voluntary choice. To round off on your business as usual and agroecological scenarios to 2050, uh, the results you show at the global scale are also reflected in your findings at the European scale, where in addition, in a third scenario, the farm to fork scenario, you show the European Commission farm to fork strategy does not meet its objectives. The upshot being only the fully agroecological scenario meets the European Commission goal of having environmental nitrogen waste. That's because your farm to fork scenario was based on, and so named after, the European Commission's strategy to meet their objective of cutting nitrogen waste in half, the EU farm to fork strategy. How do you explain that disappointing result in the farm uh, to fork strategy? But they they go not far enough. That's that's all. Uh, the 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 intention is good, but the way they are proposing it uh, is go not far enough to to reach these objectives. And this farm to fork strategy is attacked very uh, violently by lobbies. Let's bring international trade into the picture, specifically international trade in animal feed. As you say, agricultural production has increased so much not to feed people, but to feed animals. And this has been accompanied by massive trade in animal feed. And again, from a biogeochemical view, world trade in agricultural commodities like animal feed is net exchanges of protein, so nitrogen, between 12 interconnected regional agri-food systems, which taken together make up the world agri-food system. In the historical trajectory of regional specialization under globalization, in the global south, Many developing countries integrated into international food and feed trade networks as massive exporters of animal feed and subsequently rely heavily on this trade as a source of export earnings. Meanwhile, big agribusiness interests have been empowered uh, by this export trade. Geopolitics aside, the biophysical reality of all this has to do with, as you say, the effect of modern agriculture today on the environment. And so the nitrogen cycle and planetary boundaries linked to the nitrogen cycle. The point being the intensive agricultural production of animal feed in the global south uh, has huge environmental consequences, most notably deforestation. On the other side of this trade in the international food and feed trade network are the regional agri-food systems, which as you show are heavily reliant on imports of animal feeds. You gave us some context earlier on how Europe as a regional agri-food system became heavily dependent on enormous amounts of external inputs from outside Europe. At present, as your report, Reshaping the European Agri-Food System details, livestock consume 75% of Europe's crop protein production, in addition to 2.7 million metric tons of nitrogen per year in imported feed, mainly maize from the U.S. and soybeans from South America, contributing to deforestation. Your agroecological scenario at the European scale shows it is possible for Europe to feed its population without importing animal feed, and so without contributing to deforestation in the global south. And at the global scale, you show there's vast policy space to feed the world without deforestation. As some historic context to all this, talk about what you see as three international food regimes, with the third being where we are today. So start by talking about the read-through you see from the first international food regime uh, to the present third international food regime. Well, 
Yeah, yes. Uh, in fact, you, there is this first uh, international food regime, uh, which is the beginning of the yes, the beginning of the free trade for agricultural products. The first food regime in the 19th century was driven by another pioneer front. It, it was, in fact, the cultivation of the great uh, prairie, uh, the American great uh, grassland area of the Middle West, uh, which was a way to produce huge amount of cereals which were exported to Europe. And England uh, based all its policy, its imperial policy, on delegating its food production to its colonies or former colonies by, by initiating a massive uh, global trade of uh, agricultural products. And, and the, main, the, the main source of, uh, of uh, food was this exploitation of the pioneer front of the West uh, uh, region of, uh, of America. The duration of that was about 30 years, 30 for 40 years. After that, the soils were completely depleted of, uh, of nutrients. And the, the yields were very high there because there has been for millenaries uh, this herbaceous formation uh, with only uh, uh, bulbs <laughs> you know, grazing on it. But this was completely exhausted. And wh what is happening in Brazil and in, in also in, in Argentina nowadays is exactly uh, the same things. The pioneer fronts are there now uh, in uh, Latin America. And so these massive imports of soybeans uh, from uh, Latin America is the result of the sur-exploitation of a pioneer front, a new pioneer front, the last one in the planet probably, uh, that will be destroyed uh, in a few decades. So. We, we, cannot, we cannot really make plans about the capacity of these countries to continue their massive export of, uh, of soybeans and other feeds. In a nutshell, what big differences uh, mark these three international food regimes? The, the, in, the first, in the first regime, uh, okay, uh, England and, and most European countries decided to delegate their food production to others. In the second food regime, the states came back and organized its own production uh, and the modernization of its uh, production, including the Green Revolution and, uh, and so on. So they imposed the use of uh, Haberbosch fertilizer as a as a normal way to, to run agriculture. But there was a very strong state control of agriculture. The third food regime from the 1980s, more or less, is characterized by the, the general policy of neoliberalism, which means that the state is just uh, letting firms to decide of what is good or not, because the firms are closer to the market and the invisible uh, uh, hand of the market will do things much better than the state can do. Huh? Oh, yes, there are regulations, there are, there are uh, state measures taken, but most of the, orga the organization at the world's scale is the one that firms, international firms, uh, are uh, deciding. And th that's a big difference. So having been convinced that the use of industrial fertilizers was the only way to feed the world, the Harbor Bosch process and the Green Revolution was imposed in the second international food regime under strong state control of agriculture by government. You give the U.S. Marshall Plan for Europe as an example of the kind of strong state leadership you're talking about. And consistent with this, uh, when states agreed to the 1947 GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, agriculture was excluded from this original UN multilateral trade agreement. 
As we all know, this changed in the third international food regime as free trade in agriculture was brought back into force with the creation of the World Trade Organization. Plus, intellectual property rights over agricultural products, like chemical fertilizers and other proprietary technologies, gained protection under international law as the WTO replaced the GATT in the UN multilateral system of trade. And with this, agri-food systems became interconnected through international trade. The logic then of regional specialization seen in the first international food regime, which was the beginning of free trade for agricultural products, resurfaced in the third international food regime. Yes, that David Ricardo huh, at that time was explaining that uh, countries has always interest to specialize production and uh, organizing exchanges with others. So, Free trade is always better than autarky. That was the, the dogma of uh, David Ricardo. That, that's the basis of liberalism. And everybody continue to think with the same, the, the same idea that uh, free trade is better than autarky of both parties. Uh, but this is not true. And uh, enfin, this is not true. If you are looking at uh, environmental consequence, at least specialization, which is uh, the consequence of this t type of, uh, which is the consequence of free trade, specialization is uh, the cause of the opening of uh, of uh, material flows, uh, the opening of the cycles of nitrogen and uh, other substances. So, uh, free trade is really at the core of the, prob the environmental problems we have today. And that this is particularly true for nitrogen. Earlier, you said that the post on the Our World in Data site, claiming that the invention of the Haberbosch process had saved half of humanity, was absolutely not true. That if the Haberbosch process had not been invented, agronomy would have developed a better way of organizing agricultural production. So a better way of using legumes, a better way of reconnecting livestock and crop farming. Instead, what happened, as you write in your report on reshaping the European agri-food system, was that very few public resources uh, were invested in the development of more sustainable agroecological options, such as those you expose in your reports. And in spite of massive underinvestment, history tells us these systems have proven extraordinarily resilient in feeding their populations and without ruining their regional ecosystems or crossing the Earth's planetary boundaries. You point to significant upside potential yet to be tapped, as put in your Farm to Fork report, quote, there's quite a lot of diversity of agroecological systems worldwide as these are based on subtle mix and exchanges of farmer and scientific knowledge, strongly linked to territorial peculiarities. Moreover, the innovation capacity of farmers is an important aspect for the adaptability and performances of these systems in a changing world. So given everything we've been talking about, where do you think all this leaves farmers? Yes. Uh, the possibilities is vast. The, the range of possibilities is vast, but uh, the ability to act is very uh, locked. Th that's the problem. We, the, the actors locked the system in the way it is now and changing it to much better much better organization is difficult because of this looking. The power of deciding farming activities is no more in the end of the agriculture themselves. Uh, they, they are in between, uh, there is what is so, sometimes called an asymmetry of power. Huh? Uh, the, the decision, the, the, the decision power is no more at the farm level. It is upstream, the big producer of uh, fertilizer, of uh, seeds and so on, of uh, pesticides, so, and downstream, 
the, the big actors for transformation and, and uh, retail. The margin of decision of the agricultural people, of the, of the, the peasant, in fact, the, the no more peasant, but the agriculture, uh, is uh, very limited. And they, they can just make what the rest of the actors is expecting from them. That's also why it is very difficult to make these structural changes operate uh, at the farm level, except outside this big uh, network of actors. Uh, organic farmers, for instance, can, can construct new uh, network of... Uh, because they, they, can, they, can, they are much less dependent upstream and downstream from from the big actors, uh, but okay, but they are also dependent on the mar on the market at least uh, on the consumer choices and so on. So it's it's becoming very difficult indeed to to change something in this very <coughs> globalized uh, organization of uh, agriculture at the world scale. In in France, it's it's incredible the the most important uh, organization of farmers which has which is very which is a majority syndicate for for agriculture is directed by uh, the uh, the director of the biggest uh, industrial food production system the, okay. the representative the political representative of agriculture are in fact de facto the uh, the defenders of the industry. There are farmers' organizations, citizen organizations, struggling for new organization. There is a project, for instance, in, in France, but also elsewhere in Europe, I think, of Sécurité Sociale Alimentaire, food, uh, social security, you know, organized collectively in the same way as healthcare. Okay, we have the example of the health policy uh, that was put in uh, operation uh, well, in, in the 1950s, everywhere in Europe, huh, nearly, under different uh, ways. But, okay, why such an organization couldn't be possible for agriculture and food production? This conversation has gone a long way towards explaining your position that, as you put it, quote, we need to stop assuming that the only way to meet the planet's growing needs in food is continued intensification of industrial agriculture, continued specialization in agriculture, and continued growth in international trade of agricultural products. On the contrary, this model of agriculture has now been clearly identified as a factor that disturbs the Earth's system profoundly. We'll only be able to feed tomorrow's world while respecting the conditions for life on Earth by making major structural changes to the global agri-food system based on frugality, reconnection, and agroecology. So as we conclude, what message do you want to get out there? Well, I would say another world is possible. <laughs> um, it's it's not necessary that we produce more and more. Uh, the fact that the population will still be the, the world population will still be growing uh, by by two billion. After, be, before stabilizing, but because that, that's a fact. Uh, this do, does not justify at all that we intensify more and more the production. Uh, it is not necessary that new technologies like uh, uh, precision agriculture, drones everywhere, satellites and so on, it is not necessary to have these new technological tools uh, uh, in, at hand for making agriculture less polluting. We just have to reorganize, to restructure agricultural production by looking first at regional needs. Self-sufficiency 
it's not always possible. In all territories, it's not possible. But when it is possible, it should be a, a, an objective, taking into account that some regions will, will need uh, international trade. Uh, but international trade of food is not an objective in itself. Uh, so, okay, looking first at self-sufficiency, organizing uh, agriculture on a on territorial basis is much is the best way to achieve uh, an agricultural production which respects the planetary limits and the environment. So that, that's that's the message, in fact, and that that is just a question of organization. It is not a question of new technologies, and intensification, increase of production is certainly not uh, required for feeding the world. Uh, that should be the message, maybe. Gilles Balan, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.